Hi, everyone. Welcome to DPI Presents. Today, we get the opportunity to uh, interview a dear friend. Her name is Jackie Kendall of Kendall Evolve, uh, and I will let her start by introducing herself. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, it's such a great honor when you sent me the email to invite me to talk about these topics. Um, my name is Jackie Kendall. My company is Kendall Evolve Consulting. We also do executive coaching. All of our work is around helping organizations and leaders thrive. I love that. Of course, I'm passionate about leadership. So let's just dive right in and talk about company culture. I think companies think that I have to be a certain size to have a culture within my organization. You and I both know that that is not true. So talk to us about company culture. How is it formed? Like, what is it? Let us know. Sure. And I also have a couple of uh, books to recommend as well. Great. So the company culture is very uh, intangible. So there's a difference between climate, which is that which you can see, versus culture. Company culture is that undercurrent. It's the why behind how things get done. It's the unwritten rules. It's the dynamic that people can often feel, but it's hard for them to touch. So it sounds very mysterious because it actually really is. Once you start studying organizational culture, you find that, ah, this is why it's so hard to change because it's often, often so hard to identify. Okay. Yeah. It's, I love how you said it's that undercurrent. Um, mm -hmm. I know that you are an executive coach and you are passionate about transforming leadership and fostering inclusion. Uh, mm -hmm. and oftentimes we hear the word coach. I know for myself uh, as a consultant, people will say, oh, you're my coach. And I know that there is definitely a difference between being a coach and uh, you know being a consultant. But you are certified by the International Coaching Federation, but just to tell me how that, uh, you know, what exactly is an executive coach and how you are able to use this uh, really premium elite certification that you have to transform uh, organizations and specifically their leaders. Sure. So I always say the main difference between coaching and consulting, and we do both, by the way, but the main difference between coaching and consulting is a coach is really a thought partner. Mm -hmm. So when we work with leaders, we really tap into sometimes their uh, unknown potential. Maybe their strengths that they haven't yet uncovered or they haven't really figured out how to leverage and how to utilize. And we're the ones that are asking oftentimes provocative questions to get people to think and to think deeper. Mm -hmm. And so it's very inquiry based, but it's, I always say it's, it's a bit of magic um, because when I was getting certified, I also had my own coach and just that conversation and having somebody with you that can ask you those questions oftentimes that you haven't asked yourselves. Maybe it's questions you've been avoiding <laughs> um, and it just gives you the space to really focus on not only what you really want, because there is a, a, a major component of coaching that is forward looking. So what are my goals? What do I, what do I want? Where do I want to go? And then what are the mindsets and the beliefs and the behaviors that I have that can help me get there? what mm, mindsets, <laughs> what beliefs may have been hindering me, right? And so we look at all of that and we figure out based on your, you know, sometimes limiting beliefs, what do you want to do about it? The person that's being coached is in the driver's seat with our guidance. And it's also a bit of accountability. So when you're coaching someone, you're you're helping them figure out their path forward. And then, you know, between the coaching sessions, there are things that they're actually, they've actually committed to doing uh, to, you know, get closer to their goal. And we will check in to say, okay, so how did it work? A lot of times there's obstacles because we're creating, they're creating new habits. And there's always a resistance. Our brain likes the status quo. And so 
resistance comes up oftentimes unconsciously. And so we talk about that and we help them work through that so that they can be an even greater version of themselves. Oh my goodness. You said so many things that I would love to dive into. And I, I think even from a, from a personal perspective, when I first bounced into entrepreneurship, it was a space that I did not know. And there was an executive coach who was alongside me, letting me know that I could, I had so many limiting beliefs. And even in our friendship, you, you know, I've been completely honest about my kind of PTSD of part one of my career. And you've really helped me reframe that, but so patiently in, knowing that that turnaround would come where I would be able to reframe it. Uh, and so I think it is empower, it is very powerful to have, as you said, a thought partner in your business with you. I love that. And yes, you do also provide consulting services. Do you want to talk a little bit about the consulting services that you provide for organizations? Sure. I'll, I'll be briefer than I was about the coaching. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So the consulting is really around organizational or workplace culture. Um, that's the large umbrella by which we approach our consulting. And so, you know, we work with organizations that know that what's happening in the work environment may not help them reach their mission or their vision, but they don't really know what to do about that. So how do I identify the aspects of the culture that are working what's not working, you know, enablers, barriers, whatever the language is, and then what do we need to do to, to fix it? So we do a lot of uh, organizational assessments where we'll do focus groups and we talk to employees, we might do surveys, we might do one-on-one -on -one interviews, a uh, combination of that to really understand the organization and we can look at their policies or procedures or practices. And then from there, we do strategy sessions to really help them get really clear on their vision for the organization. And then what's that gap? Yes. And what are the recommendations and the things that you can do in a very practical sense to align your culture with your mission and your vision? Mm. And you. so sometimes that's identifying what are the company values? Mm. So we say we want to go here but we value, let's say they want to be, you know, an innovator, yeah. but the part of the culture is risk aversion. So how do we, how do we get where we want to go if we're afraid to take risks? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. And I love, I, I appreciate the fact that you are so data driven. Uh, you love the numbers, the assessments and being able to get in and have a multifaceted way of, of, of how you get that initial, um, those data points to understand where you can impact. Um, yeah, I love that part of your consulting. But let's talk about, I've had a lot of business owners and I know if, you know, if there's business owners who are out there listening uh, where they've gone through the process of the recruiting and the training and, you know, they've onboarded and oftentimes the employee retention piece uh, is a hard challenge in an organization which can disrupt customer service and, and really bottom line profits. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about some strategies. And I know that this is a little bit loaded, right? Because th there's a lot to that you can unpack here, but what are just some top line strategies in regards to employee retention? Ooh, this is one we can talk about for hours. <laughs> so I would start with leadership, right? Leaders have such an impact on the employee experience, right? And so there is a great difference between working with a leader who you know has your back, has your best interests, wants you to grow, it needs you to get your job done, but also wants you to grow in the way that you want to grow in the process versus a leader who is much more all about bottom line, here's the work, here's the task, thank you very much, see you tomorrow. And so when leaders take the approach of being there to help people grow their careers, uh, they actually are able to build much more solid relationships with their with their people that they're leading and build trust, 
create psychological safety. So we did say this one was loaded, this a lot. But when I work on a team where my leader has created an environment where I'm able to show up, I feel safe, I'm able to make mistakes as I learn and grow, I know that this organization is going to invest in me and is investing in me. It's going to be harder for me to just walk away. Maybe I might still end up leaving, but it won't be without having fulfilled my purpose at that organization. And so we we need to create that connection between what is a leader's role mm -hmm. in employee engagement um, and how that is so deeply connected to employee retention. Mm -hmm. People may still go, but as a leader, how have you enriched them? Right. I once had someone on my team who, when I before I started my business, I led teams and someone on my team who wanted my job in essence and wanted it in a certain time frame. And I knew, you know, it's probably unlikely that I'm leaving within this time frame that you want to be a, a vice president. Right. And so, however, I know that's your goal. So let's work together to figure out where you are now and what you need to do in order to become a vice president and what is the gap. And I helped create a development plan for that person. And I knew that once they, you know, sort of conquered those skills and, and did their own development uh, with my assistance and on their own, that they would be ready to go. And that's exactly what happened. And when that person resigned, we both cried, but we celebrated because that person was ready to move on to this this coveted role that they wanted. And so that to me is leadership. Wow, what a paradigm shift and how people should be thinking about leadership. Because many times the thinking is, I am pouring all of this energy into someone and then they're just going to leave. That is such a wonderful example. I had the exact same thing happen when I was in part one of my career. Uh, and her and I are still uh, friends and we still talk, uh, but I knew there was a greater path that she needed to be on. So as you said, to be able to enrich someone in their development and be a part of that journey with them, that is true leadership. My goodness. Thank you for sharing that. That that was, I think that's the first time I heard that story, but yeah, that's good. That's good. So a lot of times I know you and I have had conversations about uh, when we are going in and assessing culture, we could be assessing, you know, the status of someone's business in, in my regards. There is oftentimes a gap of what someone is subjectively saying about their culture or, hey, it's here. I think it's here. And then when you actually start doing your your research and understanding that the culture is uh, there's a discrepancy, right? Whether it is higher or lower, there is a discrepancy. How exactly does that happen that that you can have leaders kind of living in this fog of this discrepancy of like, well, my culture is here. It's engaging. It's people want to be here. like, And it's actually not. <laughs> that happens so often, unfortunately. I think one of the big uh, producers of that gap is leaders don't routinely get feedback right? Mm -hmm. Especially the more senior you are as a leader, it's harder for people to say, this place is just not great, right? It's harder for people to say that to their leaders. And so they're not getting the feedback, uh, which creates that, that gap in awareness. I also think that there are a fair number, and I, I think there's some statistics that say it's even a great number, of leaders who lack self-awareness. And so if I'm not self-aware, then I'm not understanding the impact that I'm having and what I've created. And so the more that we lean into building our emotional intelligence as leaders, and the more we, build, we lean into creating an environment where we are seeking feedback regularly and we're making it okay for people to tell us the hard thing for people to share that with us, um, the more we're able to understand what's truly happening in our companies. Nice. How are we able, what are some ways that we can share that feedback? I know definitely one-to-one -one and just outright overtly asking the question, um, but what are some other ways that you collect that feedback? 
or oh. leader can, yeah, look for that feedback. So what I find often is that leaders want the feedback, but they, you know, to your point, they don't know exactly how to get it. So I used to do this, this thing when I was in a leadership seat where every time we did any kind of feedback or performance reviews or any of that, I would also ask, can you give me feedback? And even though, <laughs> even though there were people who, you know, I, I made it a point to develop relationships with everyone on my team, it's still like uncomfortable people. Um, I did get feedback often, right? But it was, I could tell it was uncomfortable for people. And there, there always were a few people who I knew weren't saying everything they needed to say, right? And so one way, another way to do that is then to enlist a third party to get the feedback for you in an anonymous way. Or you could do a pulse survey. There's an email that goes out and maybe it just has two questions. It's anonymous. Um, if you've built a, an organization where people trust, then they will respond, right? And so routinely gathering input, whether it's you know a formal survey, whether it's a pulse survey, which is you know much shorter, whether you're doing upward feedback, that's another great way. So yeah. employees are able to provide feedback. Um, but I think that what happens a lot is we undervalue the magic of creating the relationships where people can give you feedback at any time during any month, mm -hmm. right? And so I would say a combination of all those things is really helpful to understand what, what's really happening. Yeah, I think that's so good. And um, I think as you are receiving that feedback and as a leader, you are making changes, what yeah. is accessible to your organization, make sure you have a we heard you moment to let that person know you're not just doing this because sometimes there is six months that might have passed when the actual change has happened, where it's that feedback has come in and you're like, okay, this is what we're able to do as you've met with your leadership team. Have that we heard you moment and, and be okay. able to say, we are directly making this change because of the information that you provided us. So um, just one small pivot and then we'll wrap up. Oh my goodness, the time goes so fast. Training and development. Obviously you and I are in this space. Uh, we know how critical it is for organizations to invest in their teams, sometimes even more than um, just a compensation raise. People want to know that they are being invested to enrich their own personal and professional um, development. So how often should leaders be investing in their teams in regard to some level of upskilling, training, um, whether it's soft skills, like your communication skills or how to manage people? How often should leaders be doing that? Ooh, that's such a good question. Uh, I want to uh, go back to the we heard you moment real quick, if that's okay. Of course. Okay. So I, I could not agree with that more. If we're asking for feedback, then we have to do something about it, right? The worst thing we can do is to do a survey and then just sit on the results. That creates and breeds mistrust. Don't ask me if you're not going to do anything about it. And so I really am a proponent of sharing the results and then sharing what we're going to do about it and then continuing to monitor our progress along the way and providing updates, right? So we heard you. This is what you said. Based on that, here's what we're going to do. And here's the timeline. And then every quarter, we're checking back in to say, here's how we did. Mm -hmm. So that way people know and, you know, you have to create the context that they understand it's not going to change doesn't happen overnight, but here's what we're committed to doing. Mm -hmm. Right. So, all right. In terms of uh, learning and development and how often, that's a hard one to answer because there are different, different, you know, factors. But I would say at a minimum, annually, there should be an opportunity for people to learn and grow. And so if we are creating individual development plans, which I highly recommend. Each employee have their own development plan. Some of the things they'll be doing on their own, maybe there's some books that the leader recommends, maybe there's some LinkedIn learning courses, maybe the organization also brings in, you know, external uh, learning and development professionals, maybe they have a learning and development team, which 
would be just ideal, right? And in that case, you could you could actually have you know more often, but at a minimum, it's a great practice to have a budget for each person in terms of their own professional development. Mm -hmm. I, I was recently having a conversation with a friend and they were talking about how they had not had any professional development in the last three years. And for me, that's just a miss because why, why wouldn't you want to develop your people and help them become more skilled? It, it benefits them, of course, but also the, the company, the organization, the team. Mm -hmm. So I think it should be a regular thing on the, on the, on the docket. Yeah. Oh, Jackie, this is exactly what I thought it would be. Um, I think you are brilliant in this space in regards to yeah. transforming not only leaders, but also organizations, the culture, that undercurrent uh, that is so felt uh, by every employee. Uh, but tell our audience, how, how can we stay in touch with you? Oh, so we're on LinkedIn. Um, it's... Kindle, K-I-N-D-A-L-L, -L, Evolve, the word Evolve, E-V-O-L-V-E. Uh, that's our handle on LinkedIn, on Instagram, and that's also our website. So any of those ways, um, if you go to our website, you can subscribe to our newsletter. We're always sending out um, tips and strategies uh, on a monthly basis. And then we do a newsletter on LinkedIn every week. And it's all focused around leadership and uh, company culture. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you so much for being with us to our audience. Thank you. Be well. Uh, and until next time, we will see you. Thank you so much. Yes. Take great care.